Now on to our second training session of the day to teach us effective lobbying techniques. I'm very pleased to introduce David Lusk, the founder of Key Advocacy, who will share tips and tricks and best practices for meetings with legislators and staffers on Capitol Hill, and Dr. Mary Carpenter, chair of our AMA's Council of Legislation, who will walk us through mock Capitol Hill meeting scenarios and share tactics on what you should do in these scenarios. Throughout the session, you can submit questions in the Submit a Question tab located on the right-hand side. All right, take it away, David. Thank you, Brittany, and thank you to the AMA for having me join everyone today, and thank you for joining us. What we'll be talking about today is what to expect in the legislative meetings that you'll be having with your members of Congress. And the first thing that I want to go over is be mindful of the amount of time that you actually have. Um, there can be a lot that we need to, to cover in these meetings, and you may be surprised as to how quickly 30 minutes goes by. If you practice or, or rehearse what you're going to say ahead of time and you actually break down all the elements of the meeting from saying hello and introducing what the issues are, completing an ask, sharing some type of personal story, you can see how little time you really can dedicate to each aspect. And one point of caution when we look at virtual meetings is they can end rather abruptly. If 30 minutes is up, you may find that that office is shutting the, the screen off and jumping into their next obligation. So if anyone has ever done a face-to-face -face meeting with legislators before, you may not have as much of a transition time as you normally would uh, virtually. You may not have as much time as you would in a face-to-face -face meeting. So that being said, you want to maximize the use of the time that you have. And one interesting thing and a little bit of research that I've seen by the Brevet Group, and they have some mind-blowing sales stats that also, I would argue, work for advocacy, is the effectiveness of remembering personal stories after a presentation. And what the Brevet Group found was that 63% of attendees of a session remembered stories that were shared, while only 5% remember statistics that were shared. So as you prepare for these meetings, as you're reviewing the data sheets and the issue briefs that the American Medical Association has prepared for you, understand that your, your meeting shouldn't be built on the numbers. The numbers should help enhance the foundation that you've already used, which would be sharing a personal story. And it's not just the Brevet Group that talks about sharing a personal story. There's an organization known as the Congressional Management Foundation which is a nonprofit that helps members of Congress better serve their constituents, but also conducts a lot of research to help the advocacy community, such as the American Medical Association, be most effective in working with legislative offices. And what this research back in 2017, referred to as the citizen-centric advocacy uh, study, found is that while almost 80% of congressional offices said that personal stories would be helpful. Less than one fifth regularly hear a personal story from a constituent. And in fact, they've also found most of the time when they're meeting with constituents, they're not really prepared. Most advocates could stand to enhance their advocacy skills and just barely over one fifth, I'm sorry, one tenth of those advocates tend to be very prepared because the office, given how, how, how unprepared many advocates are, the office does recognize and can appreciate those who take the time to rehearse what they're saying to maximize the time spent in this meeting. So it's imperative that you organize the key points and supporting arguments that you wanna make during your meeting in advance and take time to practice that. So now we'll look at seven rules for, successive, for successful legislative meetings. And before we get started, we're gonna offer a poll here. And so for this live poll that will, will pop up, what should be the first step that you take in preparing for your virtual meetings with your congressional office? So should it be begin practicing your meeting conversation? Would it be B, panic? Should you conduct a discovery about your legislator's background and interests? Or should you download and review the issue briefs provided by the AMA?
And so we'll look at what we're getting as far as responses. Okay, and it looks like the numbers are maybe solidifying. So there's actually two correct answers, or at least two acceptable answers to this question. Um, the best answer is conduct a discovery about your legislator's background and interests. It's really challenging to know what it is that you're going to say, how you're going to make your case for the issues that you'll discuss without understanding who your legislator is. But a, a very second, also a very close second, also acceptable uh, answer would be download and review the issue briefs provided by the AMA. And so when we're talking about this discovery, you know, that's rule number one, conduct the discovery. It's not going to be anything different than what you will do as a physician working with patients in the future. You can't write a prescription for any type of medic medical treatment, whether it's a medical procedure, a type of medication, physical therapy, without understanding what it is that's, that's bothering your patient and perhaps what might be the symptoms behind what's going on. So it's important to understand the interests of your lawmaker, their motivations, and what type of lawmaker you're talking to. And I'll, I'll talk about types in just a moment. So what's the best way to understand who your lawmaker is before your meetings tomorrow? Well, leverage the resources that are out there, such as look at their website. What are the issues that they post that will give you an idea as far as what is most important to their constituents or what they focus their time on while on Capitol Hill. Newsletters that they will have posted on their website will give you insight into what they've said. And also look at their social media accounts. This will give you an idea of the issues that they deem important and their approach to each issue. And as a bit of a, a sort of tip or a hint, if they're active on social media, their last 10 tweets may give you insight into what they're, they see as the most immediate concern. So you heard me talk about the different types of legislators that are out there. Now, this is a completely unfair classification, but we can generalize and say there's about three different types of lawmakers that you may confront in your meetings. The first would be the champion legislator. That would be someone who was perhaps a physician prior to becoming a member of Congress, someone who's a part of the House Doctors Caucus, or those lawmakers who typically vote in favor of the positions that either physicians or the American Medical Association support. The next type of lawmaker would be those who are uncommitted. They haven't taken a stance for or against any of the issues that either we're working on today or that typically are proposed by the American Medical Association. And then finally, those who are more challenging, those who might actually oppose the stance of the American Medical Association. Now, I wanna point out that you may think that the challenging public official is the most difficult to talk to and you may get discouraged if you realize that's who you're meeting with tomorrow. But there is research that has shown that perhaps those who are uncommitted may actually be more difficult to persuade. The challenging legislator has chosen to take a stance on an issue they feel that that issue is important and therefore perhaps we might be able to persuade them to take our side. But either way, each meeting, regardless of who you're talking with, is a part of a bigger process and each meeting is very important. And so therefore, one of the things that are also important, rule number two is to manage your expectations. Please understand there's a lot of demands on congressional offices. And as we see in some research by the Open Gov Foundation and the study called from voicemail to votes, it's nearly impossible to change a lawmaker's mind overnight. Just because we have one meeting, we won't necessarily see that legislator go from being a challenging or an uncommitted legislator to a champion. In fact, Policy change can often take continuing the conversation over a long period of time, sometimes perhaps even years, rather than just a one-time activism spike. But also it's important to manage the expectations as you come out of the meeting. While you may not have gotten a challenging legislator to, to sign on and support the piece of legislation, one of the quotes from the study is you may not get them to switch from no to yes, but you can get them to not say anything. So please understand, you may not have the same outcomes as your peers, but that doesn't mean that you weren't just as effective or perhaps sometimes more effective in these meetings. So rule number three then, something to be very careful of when you're having your conversations tomorrow, is be mindful of what I refer to as the conversation trap. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
That can be where you have a good conversation, you exit the office or you exit the, the meeting that you had feeling very good about what was discussed, but you actually didn't have an effective meeting. Sometimes legislators by design, oftentimes by accident, because they're people, people, they're, they're, <laughs> they love to talk to people, they, they love to talk about their district back home, where you may have a good conversation talking about the local college team, you could even perhaps talk about what's going on in the world, perhaps over in Ukraine, but you actually don't get to have an effective meeting in focusing on the issues. And so what do we see as far as the elements of an effective meeting that you completed your ask, that a commitment was made by the office. It might just be to learn more about the issue or to consider the issue and that there's been some type of follow-up that's been agreed to. How do you know when you're perhaps in a meeting that's a good conversation, but not necessarily as effective as possible? Well, some of the signs are you're experiencing stalls or distracting methods by the legislative office. Perhaps they, they had a flinch as to why they could or, or push back on why they might support a stance of the AMA, and we, we didn't have a good answer for that. And perhaps there was no agreed to commitment or any type of follow-up that was going on. Now, if you, if you find yourself having one of these good conversations and, and you're perhaps feeling you're not as effective in the meeting, just pivot back, get back to the issues, and understand that we only have a certain amount of time. Now, this will bring us to a second polling question that we have. Most of you tomorrow are planning to meet with your legislator, but it might be possible even at the last minute that your legislator becomes unavailable and you, even though you had this meeting scheduled with them, you're meeting with a staffer. So if this happens, should you conduct the meeting with the congressional staff, go ahead and, and hold that meeting, or should you cancel the meeting and wait until the legislator is available? So we'll switch the view here. And we'll look at what responses are. And looks like uh, thus far we have 100%. And I don't want to belabor this point too much. Absolutely continue to conduct the meeting. Um, whether the legislator is available or, or not, um, oftentimes we their, their schedules are so crazy that it's important to just get the meeting whenever we can. And so that is the, the answer. Go ahead and, and conduct that meeting with staff. Which brings us to our next rule of legislative meetings, which is, Number four, recognize the importance of congressional staff. They may not be the legislator who's voting on the chamber floor, but they're the one who conducts the groundwork and the research to help that legislator understand what issues are at stake, what are the interests that are involved. They're also those who serve as the gatekeepers and the eyes of ears for that legislator. Remember that every legislative issue goes through each congressional office, and there's no way that a member of Congress can be an expert on every issue they have to consider, but the staff are the ones who become the issue experts. Even if you may be surprised at times how young some of these staffers are that you may face on the Hill. The one unique thing about Capitol Hill is it's often a bit of on the job training. And so you could see someone who's in their mid twenties who is suddenly running the office as the legislative director or even perhaps the chief of staff by their late twenties. So the staff members are so key because they can ensure that the issues of concern reach the legislator or perhaps are even shut out. And staff may not remember every positive experience they have with constituents, but they will mostly remember the ones where they didn't have such a, a successful engagement. And so be mindful of that because they can often be with the office for a long time or on the Hill a long time or might become tomorrow's legislator. So looking at our next rule, number five, stay on message. It's important to remember that you are meeting on behalf of and representing the interests of the American Medical Association. It's based on the AMA's reputation that these meetings were scheduled. And so it's important that you discuss only the American Medical Association's legislative priorities. Now, it's not to say that your own personal issues of concern aren't important. It's just not appropriate to address them during this meeting tomorrow that the AMA has scheduled. You are more than welcome to schedule another period of time to follow up with that office and talk about these other issues of concern that you may have personally, perhaps what's going on in the world today, what's happening with the economy. It's just very important to stay focused on these issues because again, you will be so surprised how quickly your time tomorrow goes by. So this will bring us to a third and final polling question. 
And that is, what's a topic that you should never talk about in these meetings? So A would be religion, B would be personal politics, C might be financial contributions, or D, all of the above. So you should have this question being posed to you. And it looks like we're coalescing around for the most part, all of the above, we're at 100%, I see. And that is correct. There can be a lot of different personal issues. Again, I'm not saying that these issues aren't important, but we do want to avoid some of the controversial topics, things that we're not perhaps going to see agreement or eye to eye with the legislator. And so this brings us to rule number six, which is avoid these taboo topics. You're there to discuss legislative policy, not politics. Whether you like your legislator or not, or whether you're a fan of the party with which they represent or not, they're, those, they're the ones who are elected into power. There are many congressional seats that don't change party control anymore. So we tend to be faced with that party or that legislator for long periods of time. And so we're there to talk about the issues that the AMA has presented. We want to avoid talking about anything regarding campaign contributions, even if you have a family that's perhaps very well politically connected back home. There are many offices that as soon as campaign contributions are brought up, they immediately will end the meeting, regardless of, of where they are on things. We definitely don't want to ever talk about the elections that are upcoming and perhaps we'll vote for them if they choose to support the policies that we care about. And again, let's avoid any of these other controversial subjects that are out there. It's just best to stay focused on the issues that we're there to talk about and get those points across. And so then we get into our final rule, which is don't forget the follow up. You know, thank those who offered their time to, to meet with us. When you, when you send either a, a written or you could either send this by writing this out in a letter or, or sending it by email, whatever your preference is, it's most important to just send a thank you and summarize the conversation and any type of commitments that were made. If they've asked for additional information or if you have committed to providing them with additional information, do that as soon as possible. And always, always remember the five Ps. It's politely persistent people who persuade politicians. So that's everything that I had that I wanted to at least talk about today. And I'm happy to take any questions that we may have from the audience. Thank you so much, David, for that wonderful presentation. Um, yes, as David mentioned, we will take some questions right now. Um, so our first question that we have is, how often would you recommend reaching out to legislators? How often should you follow up after a legislative meeting? Well, first of all, it's a great question. It, it does matter as far as um, how your meeting went. Was there information or data that you needed to provide that office? The sooner you provide that, the better. Um, and it's okay if you're in these meetings and don't have the answer to a question that might get asked. That gives you an excuse to follow up as a commitment to that office. Um, we definitely don't want to overwhelm the office. Remember the types of commitments that they have, the obligations they have to all these different constituents. So Every couple of weeks is probably, um, if you're trying to get them information within two weeks, you might want to follow up. And if you haven't heard anything, um, if there was a commitment that they made, they were to get back to you and you haven't heard anything by about three or four weeks or so, definitely check back in. Remember that we want to look at the long term. You're trying to build a relationship. And we don't want to pester them to the point that we have sort of alienated the office or the relationship. So, Yeah, that's really important. Um, a next question. So uh, you mentioned that sometimes these meetings can end abruptly. Um, so if we don't have the full 30 minutes, which parts of the meeting out of the greeting, issue introduction and the ask, et cetera, should we start to eliminate or should we just instead do every part quicker? Well, the number one reason why we're having these meetings are to, to complete a congressional ask of some type. And so leading into these meetings, there are three different issues that the American Medical Association is focused on. And so rather than what we want to admit, what we need to focus on is let's get the ask out as quickly as possible. Um, if we know that time is limited, we may only have 15 to 20 minutes. Go through the greeting rather quickly. You know, make certain to restate that you're a constituent so they know that you're someone who can vote for or against them when the elections come around. They want to understand that they represent who you are. Um, 
but try to, to minimize the amount of supporting information, share that personal story and the ask. Uh, any type of supporting information or statistics should come out rather quickly. And then as you close the meeting, make certain to restate that ask. That's really what's important to, to let them know why we're here to, to talk about it and, and find out what it is, what their stance is on the various issues we're, we're to discuss, so. Okay. Um, if we find ourselves in an uncomfortable place uh, during our visit, what is the best way for us to kind of pivot out of that? Focus on the issues at hand. Don't take anything personal. Um, perhaps maybe they had a really bad experience with a different office. Perhaps if you're meeting with a staffer, maybe their boss just yelled at them. Uh, don't take it personal. Uh, it's, it is not an easy job to be a member of Congress. And it's an even trickier job to be a staff member for a member of Congress. So uh, try to try to shelve the personal feelings as best as you can and understand we're here to talk about the issues and just bring the conversation back to the three issues that we're to talk about. And even sort of note, I know we don't have a lot of time out of respect for your time. I know that you have a really busy schedule. Let's get back to these issues rather than engaging and going sort of down a different direction than, than what's best. Perfect. Um, I, we're meeting so tomorrow. They're meeting with their legislators in groups. So do you have any, any recommendations on how if we should organize for primarily one person to speak or rotate through all students willing to speak? It's best to have a leader who, a leader who perhaps uh, opens up the meeting and, and concludes the meeting. As you talk with your colleagues before this meeting, Plan out perhaps who has the best approach to each of the three issues. It's okay to have multiple people speak. We just need to be careful that the time will be limited. And at best, if we've got 30 minutes, that's 10 minutes per issue maximum. So we have to be very careful to, to get through things. The, the benefit to having a leader of the group is if we do start to get a little sidetracked, if we're slipping behind on time, then they can kind of bring us back to the key points or start to conclude the meeting. I've seen a lot of meetings where we have multiple people talking and each of them try to, to conduct their own greeting and start to talk about things they care about outside of the issues. And suddenly the entire meeting goes by, which is fine for the legislative office because then they don't have to make a commitment. And oftentimes you leave that meeting feeling kind of great. We had this great conversation. So it's always, you know, remember the keys to the effective meeting. Okay. Um, another question we have here is, would the finding common ground, like sharing political support, help foster a more trusting environment where the legislators would be more inclined to support the AMA's advocacy efforts? I understand that it can be seen as taboo, but I thought it may be beneficial if we were respectful to both parties, but shared common interests when um, applicable. It's a great point. And in fact, if we were to do a deeper dive of advocate training for a session, the key to building rapport with an office is to find that common ground, that common bond that can also help your, your story or your conversation stand out more. So that's a great thing to try to do. Um, but do understand we are there to support policy, not politics. And the AMA tries to be as bipartisan as possible. We have razor thin majorities in both the House and the Senate, which means that it's an unusual piece of legislation that gets through with only one party support. We need to work across both sides of the aisle and work with both parties. And so it's always important to, to not turn this conversation into a political conversation, but to make a policy conversation. Okay. Um, so in these types of meetings where there might be six or seven constituents, is it feasible that everyone be involved or would it be best to just have a few vocal people? Given the time constraints um, and that Again, we have a maximum of 30 minutes. We may have less than that because we never know when that office might get called to another obligation of some type. Um, it's probably best to keep it minimal as far as the folks who are speaking and who are involved. Um, certainly let everyone perhaps have a chance to say hello in the greeting portion, you know, about the first two to three minutes. But it's really important that we get these asks out, stay focused. And there have been many a meeting where an individual thought they had five or 10 more minutes to go and all of a sudden that office had to, to end the meeting abruptly and they never got their ask out. Um, so is it best to touch on every issue or if we're having a good conversation on one of them, just keep working on that topic? It's really best to focus on all three issues. These are legislative priorities 
for the AMA at this time. Uh, some of them are, are the types of issues that will take longer conversations to perhaps get to fruition or to get past this policy. So we definitely want to touch on all three issues whenever possible. Um, obviously, if, if something happens where the meeting gets cut short and you were only able to talk about one or two, uh, don't get too discouraged. You can try to follow up at another time, but it's really important that these three priorities be discussed in our meetings tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And can you share some tips about approaching meetings regarding controversial topics? Yep, avoid controversial topics <laughs> at any cost. I don't really think the three issues that we're to talk about um, will be found as controversial. I know that there's a lot going on in the world right now between what we're seeing in foreign affairs, with our economy, inflation. It's best to avoid these kind of things um, because we, we sort of have two interests that we're dealing with, the interests of the legislator and perhaps the interests of the staff we might be working with. And we want to be sensitive to everyone's own beliefs. So let's just keep it on policy that the AMA has asked us to, to talk about. And, and again, it's the American Medical Association who has set up these meetings. We're there on behalf of the AMA. So really we owe it to the association to talk about the issues that they've asked us to be a part of right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and to all of you who've also submitted a question, there will be another Q&A session at the end. Um, but next, we would love to uh, set up a discussion with Dr. Carpenter. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brittany. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to start us off. Um, Dr. Carpenter, you are the chair of our AMA's Council on Legislation. Um, so we're wondering, can you expand more on the work the COL does and how it may align um, with our three topics? Sure, Brittany. And I think, excuse me, the one of the best ways to show you how the COL works is to talk about just one particular issue, which is our telehealth issue that we're um, that you're going to be talking about tomorrow. So years ago, um, probably seven or eight years ago, even the COL started to look at issues with telehealth. They knew this was an upcoming issue that there would be things that were going to need to be um, worked out, principles that needed to be um, to be worked out to present that was going to make good legislation, good care for patients and work for physicians. So the COL um, over the course of, of some time worked on this issue and developed principles that they felt were to be paramount for any legislation that was gonna come forward about telehealth. Once those, and, and that happens with lots of different subjects. And once those principles have been um, designed, have been agreed upon within the council, then those are usually shared with the board of trustees for their questions and um, comments and support. Once those principles are supported then by the council and by the board, in the case of the telehealth issue, then those were shared with the council on medical service, obviously with great interest in the whole, how telehealth was gonna be um, used for patients and how legislation would go forward. The council on medical service then developed a report to the house, to the board and to the house, outlining these principles, embedding them in their report so that the house could approve those and, and be um, able to, to comment on those uh, principles or make any suggestions, changes as the debate goes on in the house. Mm -hmm. um, once those were approved, then those principles are used to develop legislation, both draft legislation that might be used in states, but also um, principles that could be lobbied for on the Hill for legislation that was coming forward to make sure that those important things to patients and physicians were included in any legislation that would go forward. And now we have the Telehealth Modernization Act, which actually started, it was how this um, whole thing started and the result that came forward. Um, that same sort of um, process is now beginning with physician payment reform for Medicare. So the council will look at those issues, start to develop principles, those will go forward and, and we'll proceed in the, same, in the same sort of process. Oh wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, so in your career, you've had to conduct congressional visits and can you kind of tell us any lessons you've learned so far? 
I'm, I'm not sure I can give you any better lessons than what David just <laughs> shared with everybody. Um, the um, all of the things that he talked about are things that you 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 need to have in your head when you go and practice on, right? So um, I think when we do our and, and as in my delegation in South Dakota. Um, which is a small AMA delegation, but we also have a small congressional delegation. Um, when we do Hill visits, we have a planning meeting ahead of time um, to talk about who's going to be the leader, to be in charge of making sure that we get all of our issues out there, that the time is being managed and that the, the um, meeting is, is opened and ended um, in a way that we can get done what we need to get done at that meeting. Um, and and I, I think that's important. Um, I think the other thing that um, I've learned locally with our state legislature is that those relationships need to happen before you have an ask. So we need to get to know our legislators, um, meet with them um, in our in our district. We started having meetings every year um, and inviting our legislators to come, not for any particular issue, but just so that we could meet them, they knew who they were, who we were, and we knew who they were, and we could have conversations about issues that came up during that session. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, how do you define a successful visit? And I was wondering if you had a story or two of um, what you've considered your most successful visit with any kind of elected official. Well, I think recently one of the most successful visits we had was when we were talking about the surprise billing um, issue that was um, before Congress. And we had a meeting back at home. It wasn't actually in DC with our um, representative in, in, in South Dakota. We only have one. Our whole state is a district. So we have one representative um, and talked about that issue. And, and our representative had lots of questions about that, requested more information, um, the, the discussion went on for a while, and I think we got to educate that legislator about something that hadn't maybe been on their office's radar. Um, and, and if they ask for more information or ask questions about um, what we're trying to discuss, I think that is a sign of a successful meeting. We've piqued their interest. They're going to look for um, information, more information to come. And I think we have um, an opportunity to, to at least maybe guide their thoughts on, on where that's going. Um, and then, of course, a successful meeting also means that we got a chance to relate back to, to, to our locality why this is important. You know, um, telehealth in South Dakota is easy. We have a lot of geography, not very many people. In, and it's very important to our state to improve care for our patients. And so those kind of stories about how that happened, um, I think um, when we get a chance to do that, I think that means that it's a successful meeting. Thank you so much for that. So now we will transition into our kind of like mock training. So um, we're going to have four different scenarios in which I will act uh, as a staffer. Dr. Carpenter will act as the constituent in the meeting. And then Dave will kind of come on and uh, comment on, on how we're modeling these different situations. Um, so first off, we're going to model um, how to introduce yourself like in a visit. Are you ready? All right, so, um, hi, welcome. Hi, hi Brittany, um, I'm Mary Carpenter and thanks for letting us be here to talk to you. Oh, okay. So what we saw there, uh, Dr. Carpenter came in, just, she was factual, she stated her name, but she failed to let her know who's, what medical school she's attending, what the constituent tie was, why they were there, who they were representing, who she's representing. So it's important when you first come in to denote who you are, who you are part of, what's the organization behind everything, and what you're hoping to accomplish today. Okay. Um, so then let us kind of model that correctly. Okay. Hi, welcome. 
Good afternoon, Brittany. Um, thank you for taking the time to um, meet with us today. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Carpenter and I practice um, at home um, in South Dakota. Um, attended medical school at the University of South Dakota and am here to visit with you about some very important issues that the AMA has to bring forward um, today at this visit. Perfect. Um, next, uh, we will uh, model how to deliver the ask. Okay, so so nice to meet you, Dr. Carpenter. Uh, those issues sound really important. These issues are really important to physicians and to patients, um, and so um, we hope you'll um, show some interest in these issues. Okay, um, so what would you like the Congresswoman to do with this information? Well, these issues are very important to um, to our patients and to the constituents. So the congressman uh, congresswoman really needs to support these issues. So I'll chime in here. Um, one of the things that is a that often does happen, which is exactly how Dr. Carpenter handled this portion, where they're asking for support of an issue. What does support entail? What does that mean? Make certain that the ask is explicit. We need you to support these issues by co-sponsoring a piece of legislation that's already out there, working to see that this type of legislation is introduced. And another thing that can be very helpful when you are presenting your ask is to find out how much that individual, whether it's the legislator, whether it's the staffer, actually understands the issue itself, what their knowledge base is, so that you can approach the ask given what their understanding is. And they'll show the, a better way of doing this. Um, so nice to meet you, Dr. Carpenter. Those issues sound really important. These issues are very important to um, both the physicians um, where we live and our patients. And what there are three issues that we need to discuss with you today. The first one uh, has to do with um, a payment reform and the issue of the alternate alternative payment models um, that were um, in the changes in Medicare payment. Um, there's a House Bill 4587, which is the Value Act, and it will change, or excuse me, it will prolong the 5% potential incentive for um, physicians to join alternative payment models, which will be important to improving care to our patients and um, allowing uh, physicians to make improvement in the value of care that's provided in physician for, or provided by physicians to their patients, excuse me. We also uh, would like support um, from the Congresswoman for um, telehealth and the Telehealth Modernization Act. Uh, House Bill 1332 and Senate Bill 368, um, which would change uh, the rules about all um, uh, sites, originating sites for telemedicine visits. These are very important in our district due to our geography with long distances to travel, sometimes bad weather, elderly patients um, that can really take advantage of these telehealth visits and improve um, health and uh, ability to care for our patients. And thirdly, um, we also want to talk about reduction of burden in prior authorization, uh, especially in Medicare Advantage plans. Both in House Bill 3173 and Senate Bill 3018, um, there would be changes to these rules that would lessen this burden and allow patients um, to have better access to the medications they need. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about any of these, but we would really like to see the Congresswoman's support on these particular issues. Okay, thank you. I'll be sure to relay that to the Congresswoman. Thank you so much. Next, um, we're going to model how to pivot when, when you deal with a difficult situation. Um, so we would really appreciate um, the representing, representative lending her name as a co-sponsor to House Bill 1332 with the Telehealth Modernization Act. And we would hope that she could support that, that it would be important to um, our patients back home. Well, there have been a lot of legislative priorities that have come up in response to COVID-19, some that arguably deserve more attention, 
than telehealth. Why should the Congresswoman care about this? Well, if the Congresswoman cares about um, access to care for her patients in her district, I think she would support this. Excuse me? These are important things that she needs to pay attention to. So one of the things we saw is perhaps a little bit of composure that was lost by Dr. Carpenter. Again, it's important to sort of shelve the personal as best you can. Um, if you're finding some difficulty in, in the conversation and having them really understand why these these issues are relevant, put it on the put it into the interests of the constituents of that legislator. Telehealth not only helps uh, folks who are in a rural community, someone like me who had a major knee surgery a couple of years ago, I didn't have to worry about crutches in the middle of winter and getting to my physician's office. Uh, if COVID, if there was an outbreak of COVID, it was safer to do a visit from back home than going into a medical office where there might be a lot of folks who are already sick. If we're looking at issues about prior authorization, there's nothing like heading into a surgery as a patient and being worried that the office remember to, to contact my insurance company and get that prior authorization. Things that interrupt continuity of care for the patient, things that produce negative outcomes for the constituents regarding healthcare. And now we'll model a successful conversation. So um, we would really hope that the Congresswoman could support um, House Bill 1332, the Telehealth Modernization Act um, of 2021. We really feel this will be a, an important um, uh, issue to our patients back home. Well, there have been a lot of legislative priorities that have come up in response to COVID-19. Some that are arguably deserve more attention than telehealth. Why should the Congresswoman care about this? Well, I would just like to um, talk to you about what my colleagues have seen starting out during COVID with being able to continue to care for their patients when telehealth um, rules were relaxed and they were able to continue to make sure that their patients were healthy, that their patients were getting their medications that they need, that we knew that even though they couldn't come to the office, we could support them and make sure things were going well. One of my colleagues had a very ill parent who was in the middle of um, chemotherapy and not able to safely go to the office for follow-up appointments because of their um, uh, potential for developing COVID and having severe uh, problems and were able to continue to get that care that they needed through telehealth because the rules had been relaxed. We found that this works for patients. We found that the patients really like this opportunity, not that they won't go to see their physician, but it gives them an alternative way to be able to stay in contact with their physician. So we really hope that the Congresswoman could support these changes that will really provide improved care for their patients. Oh, oh. thank you for that. Um, I will keep that in mind. Brittany, if I could chime in one other, one other point to, to make. Um, we sort of saw Dr. Carpenter doing this and I just wanted to kind of emphasize what she was doing. She started to talk about like a greater coalition of interests that were benefited by this policy. That's a great way to, to be successful with an office, especially if perhaps the staffer or the legislator doesn't under, understand why the issue is so important. We have to sometimes connect the dots for them and help them understand the greater the coalition that's helped, especially if it's an easy lift by that office, the more likely it is to happen. Thank you. All right. And so finally, we're going to model how to close out your meeting. Wow, you gave some really great informa information, shared some super thrilling stories. Well, I appreciate um, you being able to talk to us and thank you. Oh, okay. Goodbye. <laughs> so what we saw was a rather abrupt ending. Um, we didn't restate the asks. You know, it's important, regardless of what we've talked about, to remind the office why we were there, what the issues are, and what we need them to do, what the actual ask is. We need them to either co-sponsor legislation or see that legislation is introduced on an issue. Um, ideally, if we could get some type of commitment, whether it's they're going to follow up with us or if we're going to follow up with them. And we had this great opportunity to meet with an office. 
whether it's in person or whether it's virtual. Get a screenshot if you were conducting a virtual meeting, get a photo with that legislator or their staff, but first ask permission to do so because this gives you an opportunity to post on social media and praise the legislator for taking time to meet with constituents. It's also something that you could send to the office, another excuse for following up and building rapport. We had this great photo or this great screenshot was taken. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Legislators can use that in their newsletters. There's a lot of ways that things can be recycled. Perfect. Um, and now we'll model a successful way to kind of end your visit. Wow, you gave some really great information and shared some super thrilling stories. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Um, we really would ask the Congresswoman's support of these three issues and the bills that I had previously uh, talked to you about that include the Telehealth Modernization Act, um, the change in Medicare reimbursement with the alternative payment models, and then with the um, unburdening of the prior authorization system. I would be happy to provide you with any further information or any answers to any questions you may have after you look at the information that we've already left you, um, but would love to follow up with you if you have any questions. I'm also going to leave you our contact information for the people that were here at the visit today. So if there's any particular question for any one of us, um, we um, you'll be able to get in touch with us and we'd be able to answer your question as quickly as possible. Again, thanks for taking your time. We know you're busy and we appreciate the opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much to uh, Dr. Carpenter and David for kind of coming along with us as we model some of these and important parts of your the meetings that you may run into tomorrow. And so now we'll transition to the Q&A portion. So um, we already have a couple of questions queued up. So the first one um, is, how do you respond if the staffer tells you a version of there's no appetite for this or this is too expensive and won't pass during the cycle? Dr. Carpenter, do you want to take this first or? Oh, go ahead, David. It, it, again, it's 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 it can be challenging to do so. We we hear a, a response that we weren't really hoping for or, or weren't expecting at all. Um, we want to politely get back to the issues and remind them that there are constituents that that are at risk that can be benefited by this. Uh, some again focus on the the larger coalition. It's not just helping physicians; it's also helping their constituents who are the patients that physicians are treating. Streamlining effective care helping aid the delivery of, of health care. How, how can someone not want to help out others if, if it's as simple as a policy change that results in better health care? To me, that seems like a great opportunity. Um, and also understanding there are tremendous demands on each office. They are going to have their own priorities. We understand that. Uh, we have to sort of politely be persistent, as I had said earlier, uh, not engage in, in any type of of sort of controversial topics or, or or becoming sort of antagonistic with that office and how can we best emphasize that there's value, that there's positive value in considering our issues and taking the steps that we're asking. Mm -hmm. The one other thing that that I found is that when when we've been prepared for these meetings by the AMA, when we've had the information given to us ahead of time, um, the lobbyists often know if one, there's not an appetite for this, or two, somebody's going to come and tell you that there's just, it's too expensive, there's not money. And I've found that the AMA is very good about giving us responses to those issues so that you can be prepared a little bit for those expected, um, you know, negative kind of reactions to what you're asking for. Sometimes you get those about subjects that you don't expect and and that's very difficult. But um, I've just always found that those kind of things we've been prepared for. So we have at least some kind of answer or way to pivot out of that um, in the education that we've been given before the visits. And it's, it's the value in practicing and preparing. And, and remember what we had said about signs of maybe a good conversation and not an effective meeting expect that pushback or I refer to it as the flinch 
understand what their argument might be. If you're prepared for that, if you expect it, then you'll have an answer that can easily address that, that doesn't lead to some type of antagonistic exchange. So. Perfect. Um, to go to Dr. Carpenter. Um, should every single person introduce themselves during a meeting or just uh, the person or people who will be doing most of the talking? Oh, when, when we do our meetings, we have every person introduce themselves when the meeting starts. I think for two reasons. One is so that the staff or the um, Congress people know who's there and, and there's some sort of beginning of a relationship. And I think that's useful. I think sometimes both if you introduce yourself and where you're from, at least being physicians and, and again, in a state that's small, we find that the, the staffer or the um, congressperson may know because you took care of their sister or their grandpa or their you know niece or whatever. And so that sort of builds a connection right away. Um, and again, you have to be careful that that doesn't lead you down 30 minutes of talking about, you know, what happened back home because, and that's why the person that I think is going to be the leader in that conversation has to be able to um, practice sort of intervening and getting things back on the, you know, how they're going to do that if that starts to happen, because you see that a lot. Um, but I, I think that everybody should introduce themselves. And I, I know that the office will know who's coming because they have to, you know, say they have to check that all and know who's going to be there. But I still think the introductions very short or important. I don't know, David, what you think. No, I firmly agree, Dr. Carpenter. First of all, they may wonder why is there an individual that's sitting in this meeting? Who are they? Are they media? <laughs> you know, we always want to be as above board as possible, disclose everything. But also to Dr. Carpenter's point, someone perhaps brings up, oh, they're currently studying at this medical school and oh, a family friend was treated there. They really have fantastic treatment at that facility or I know someone that went there. It's a part of the discovery process. It helps us get more information to what someone had asked about earlier, the common bond. It may give us another opportunity to be more memorable. Um, we just have to be mindful that we really only have about two to three minutes to do those type of greetings, preferably closer to two. Um, but if you stay precise and concise, it can be effective. So. But I, I do think it's important that everyone should say hello. Again, it just, I would wonder why someone's sitting there and who are they and what are they trying to accomplish by being here? And you know, could they be a member of the media? There's so much sort of gotcha into politics anymore that we want to be as above board and as helpful and as transparent as possible. Okay. This will go to David. If we notice some hesitancy or resistance from the legislators for the issues that we are raising, would it be acceptable to transition to another issue? I think what would be important is to understand where the hesitancy is coming from or, or what the concern is or why there's a lack of uh, either emphasis or why they don't see this issue as important. Again, look back to what you're learning as, as future physicians. You have to understand, you have to draw out from your patients, you know, what are the issues that they're facing? What are the conditions? What are the symptoms that are going on? You know, When they do something, this is what sort of triggers something to get worse or, or makes it better. So. Uh, before moving on, we want to get a feel for why is it that they don't see that issue as a priority or why they may, may be opposed to us. It may give us more insight that we can then circle back to our medical society or circle back to the AMA, give them more information to then have an effective strategy moving forward. Perfect. Right. And so this question will actually be addressed to both of you. What are some things that you think should be included in a follow-up email to a staffer? I can, I, I will tell you that when we've had our meetings um, as a delegation from South Dakota, um, almost always our exec of our state medical association is there with us and, and they do the letter. And the letter, whether this is right or wrong, this is how we always do it. The letter is basically just a synopsis of the meeting that we had. It's thank you very much for the time. It was good to talk to you about, you know, whatever we may have talked about before we got to the issues. These are the three issues that we wanted to talk about. These are the reasons that they're important to um, our delegation. And um, we would love to follow up with you if you have any questions or concerns about the um, requests that we've made. 
You know, it's important in any follow-up message that we send that we be as brief as possible, but thank you is definitely something that needs to be in every message. And surprisingly, there are those who meet with legislative offices who don't say thank you for your time or having been a Hill staffer, having known folks who have either been in office or, or worked for, for members of Congress, it's not an easy job. I mean, it's only, it seems like it's only gotten worse. So even perhaps saying thank you for serving in this role um, could be beneficial, um, but also restating what was discussed. If there was anything unique that you could bring up that would make the conversation more memorable, something that was a key point that perhaps they agreed with, and then restating the ask. Perfect. Um, kind of in that same vein, David, can you provide some more examples of what a reasonable ask is? Is it mainly voting yes on these bills? Is there, is there anything else we, we are asking for? Well, you know, you, you kind of hear about like sort of smart decision making, like, is it specific? Is it measurable? Is there some type of an action? Is it reasonable? Is it timely? So, um, and, and really you can translate that into any type of ask that you might have. If it's just to better understand an issue or learn about an issue, you know, how much time do they have to really learn about this? Do we know that a piece of legislation is related to the budget or appropriations process? So there is a certain limit of time. limit of time. Is it something like, Medicare physician cuts that have a period of time where they're going to worsen. And so it, we need to let them know that there is a time sensitive, time sensitive, excuse me, time sensitivity to some of these things. And that's important for them to understand. Um, when it really, when it comes to, you know, you look at that sort of Medicare physician cut issue, it's constantly just duct taped and band-aided together. Maybe here's what we need right away, and perhaps in the longer term is a, a, a better fix. But um, it is important to kind of let them know what it is that we need, as specific as we can be. Is there a timeline involved? And perhaps what are the ramifications, either for or against, if they do this action or don't do this action? So. Okay. And Brittany, just one thing that seems that's pretty obvious, but I've been in meetings where um, this mistake was made and that so if you have specific legislation that you want them to to co-sponsor sign on to you know support and but I've been in meetings where somebody didn't do their follow-up homework and so it's we would really like the senator to co-sponsor this bill or really like the senator to sign on to this you know to this legislation and the staffer says they already did um, which is kind of a big whoops, you know, and those things change. And so you just need to make sure you recheck your information before you go so that you're accurate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, well, this will also go to you, Dr. Carpenter. So should we introduce everyone before the leader opens up the discussion or should we open the discussion first and then introduce ourselves? Um, I, I guess I don't know if there's a, a proper way to do this. And in, in, in the meetings that I've been in, that we when everybody's there, we go around the table and everybody says who they are and why they're there. The very first thing. Um, and then um, we start in with the issues after that. And I don't know, David, if you think that's the right way or you should do it issue at a time. I don't know. Me personally, I think I would take the same approach that Dr. Carpenter talked about. It's it's get that sort of more ancillary portion out rather quickly. You can break up the conversation if you're starting to get, to get into a good, and again, these meetings should be conversations, not information sharing, right? We want some level of back and forth. Um, and I think it's difficult to do that if we're talking about you know the, the benefits to rethinking the, the cuts to the Medicare physician payments. And all of a sudden, oh, by the way, and then here's Brittany, we're sort of, <laughs> interjecting the conversation and, and breaking things up and, and getting the, the conversation off track. Uh, I just think it gives you more time to, to, to get into the issues and provide the personal story and the supporting information that demonstrates why this is a, a crucial issue for them to even consider. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say do the introductions first to get those out of the way. Okay. Um, when it comes to kind of the follow-up, when you're wanting to thank the staffer for kind of taking the meeting, should there only be one person kind of sending that message and maybe CCing the others, or should each individual person kind of do a follow-up message? Um, those would be to David or Dr. Carpenter, whichever. I guess both have me. Dr. Carpenter, well, what, like I said, when we do our response, um, 
we we do that as one letter with all of our signatures at the bottom. Um, but if there was a particular question that was asked to a particular member of the delegation that's meeting with the um, at, at that time, like somebody might say, I know you live in in this city and there was this issue and that conversation happens, then there might be just a separate um, thank you, but also follow up regarding information if the if the question was directed to a specific person. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that, especially is there some type of common bond that came up when, again, when you mentioned the the medical school where you currently are, are studying, oh, I had a friend that went there or my, you know, my uncle was treated there. Um, you could bring up that sort of the commonality that makes the conversation overall more memorable, um, but we definitely want to be cautious about inundating the office. And if we had 10 people in a virtual meeting and everyone sent a letter that was identical, that probably doesn't make as much sense. It's, it's, you know, are we taking more time to to personalize what we're what we're talking about in this follow up, and is there a value in the follow up? That's probably the biggest question. Yeah. Is it better for just one, or is there something that stands out? Then that would make sense to have other people follow up as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, this will go to you, David. Um, if someone is already a co sponsor, do we just thank them and move on to the other issues, or do we still discuss why the issue is important for the AMA? I would say definitely thank them for being a co-sponsor. Um, ask, is there anything that we, so by co-sponsoring a piece of legislation in effect that legislator has stuck their neck out on behalf of you know, our interests. What else can we do to be of value to them? Um, we heard Dr. Carpenter talk before about, we know we're gonna make an ask at some point. It's almost like this cup of political chips that eventually we know we're going to have to empty. So how much can we fill it before we have to empty it? If they are a co-sponsor, what can we do to help them out? Um, would they like to hear from constituents thanking them for doing so? Uh, are there other legislators that they would like to see targeted? We can go back to the medical society or back to the AMA and let them know there's someone else that they've asked us to reach out to in the delegation or someone else to focus in the chamber that we should really put our efforts towards. So how can we benefit that lawmaker who has benefited us by becoming a co-sponsor. One of the things you really want to look into as best as you can. Again, covering that quickly. Don't distract from the other asks that you have because we already know we have success there. Uh, but thank them for the support and how can we be of benefit to their support since they benefited us. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Great advice. And um, this question will go to both you, Dr. Carpenter and David. So what should we do if we get stuck in the small talk of the meeting? Like how do, can we best transition out of that? Dr. Carpenter, you're a, an expert at this, so I'll let you take that first. I'm probably not an expert. I, I, I think though that I think this happens almost every time that you go to a meeting, at least, like I said, in a place that's that's small and everybody knows everybody where I live. That's why I think you have to have the leader who's ready to to change the subject, you know, and and have to have the other people in the meeting understand that when that happens, that should stop. I mean, you can get so interested in having those conversations about whatever it is that you, I think, don't even realize that you're taking up a lot of time. And so we sort of have to have an agreement when we go in there that that whoever it is is going to be the leader, and if they if they say you know it's really nice to have this time, but we need to present this, that that stops. I that you know that you're um, that you're helping whoever's going to be in charge get out of that, and that's how we would deal with it. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think of an example that I actually was involved in several years ago um, in Washington D.C. They say there's an association for everything, and this is I was a, I was working with the Association for Associations. We're in talking to a House office. I'm with other government affairs professionals who should be experts at this. And exactly what Dr. Carpenter talked about was happening, where we were caught up in the small talk. The asks had never gotten out yet. We hadn't even gotten to the asks. And in the back of my mind, I had sort of a, a timer that was going and realizing we're going to run out of time here. And I just sort of abruptly, but politely interrupted things said, well, you know, we really need to understand how busy you are. We really need to talk about these issues as to why we're here and bring it back to, to the, the three points that we have before us now. 
that's where the benefit of practicing with your colleagues. Um, it, go back and look at the slide where I actually broke down a meeting into little two to three minute segments and, and understand if we have three asks that we have to get out and we have five minutes left, how are we going to give two minutes, even just two minutes to each ask? Um, and you've just got to be mindful of that. We usually actually assign somebody to be a timekeeper surreptitiously, not with the stopwatch, but you know, <laughs> just kind of keep an eye on your on your um, on your watch or on your phone or whatever it is, however you keep time, to know that if we're running out of time and we haven't gotten to the end, somebody needs to you know somebody needs to move that along. So we usually have that assigned too. That's the benefit of a virtual meeting is most likely somewhere on your screen will be the clock telling you what time of day it is. Focus on when that meeting started and know when your stop time is and work back work backward from your stop time. If you do in the future uh, a face-to-face -face meeting, have someone, one of the things I always cheat is I sit so I can actually see the clock where it's in my normal line of sight. So it, I don't have to pull one of these and where you're looking at your watch, uh, you want it to be as subtle as possible, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to David. Um, what if we get asked a question that we don't really know the answer to? So, great thing to have happen, believe it or not, um, because it is it is an obligation that they have now asked of you to follow up. Do not ever, ever guess at an answer. You know, restate the question. That's a really good question that you asked. Um, you know, I actually don't have the answers to that, but I'll get that information for you. So now remember I talked about an effective meeting has a commitment that was made, and it might be you committing to get them more information when you circle back to the office, whether it's by phone call, whether it's in an email, if you're meeting with the legislator, they're probably going to tell you who to follow up with, most likely. If you're following up with a staffer, uh, you're probably going to follow back up to that staffer. But you know, let them know well, your boss, you know, the congresswoman asked me to get this information. So I'm I'm contacting you, I'm emailing you, I'm I'm calling you about this to provide this information that I didn't have. Um, but talk to your medical society. They may have someone else who needs to follow up on something and perhaps it's more appropriate for someone from the medical society to follow up. Uh, but open up that communication stream with your medical society so we understand we don't want seven different people following up on the same topic. We want to make it a little bit easier. Um, but it's it's actually an opportunity. Don't be embarrassed about that because I can assure you there might be one or two things that you may get stumped on as far as questions they may ask, but you're the folks who are on the front lines who are the future of our medical profession. You're going to have more knowledge unless any of those staffers or legislators have been physicians in the past. You have more knowledge, you understand things. So don't let one little item that you don't know all the details to slip up or slip you up. Just it's an opportunity to follow up and build rapport. Oh, amazing advice. Um, so that's again to you, David. So to clarify, our options for what we are asking for is to co-sponsor, sign on, or general support. How do we decide which one to ask for? And don't these bills already have many co-sponsors? Well, you want to look at the, the issue briefs the three handouts, uh, depending on, can't quite re recall uh, what they're what they're called, whether it's handouts, whether it's issue briefs, one pagers, there should be guidance on what the asks are. Um, I'm not really in a position to sort of say what the specific asks are. Um, if you do have any questions, I would say follow up with your, with those who are leading your medical society or, or follow up with the AMA. Um, it, it should be pretty obvious as far as what the asks are. Um, and, and what the solutions would be in, in those documents, so. Um, and then um, this could be for you, Dr. Carpenter. So how, where do we check if the representative has already signed on or supports a bill? Like what resource uh, could, can they access? Well, I will tell you that because it's way easier for me, I ask the executive medical association to have that done. I, but I know there are places you can go look that up. And David, you might be the better person to answer, ask, or to have the specifics because I I have somebody else that I asked to do it for me. Yeah, you can actually Google, um, just search the bill number. Um, there's a there's a legislative website that Congress has um, for the House version of legislation and the Senate version. It'll tell you who the co-sponsors are. One word of caution on that. And this happened for a client I worked with last year. 
they may be in the process of becoming a co-sponsor, but it hasn't been published yet. There can actually be a slight delay in the paperwork getting sent to, although it's usually electronic, not really hard copy paperwork. There could be a slight delay in getting it to the key office that, that handles co-sponsorship or who's signing on to a bill. And it could be a lag from when they get that to that being uploaded into Thomas, the, the legislative database. Um, so be mindful if they, if you do your research right before the meeting, the morning of, and they say, oh, we're a co-sponsor of that bill. Well, actually, are, are you sure that you sent the paperwork along? Because I, I checked this morning and, and I didn't see your boss's name on there. I didn't see your name on there. Uh, it might be in process, but I haven't seen it yet. And I'm happy to keep an eye on this if you'd like and let you know once I see that, that it's up there. Because uh, one time it happened where the legislator claimed to be a co-sponsor and they were not. Uh, another time it was due to the paperwork getting processed and someone actually hadn't sent it along. We kind of found out that a staffer in that office hadn't sent along what they were asked to do. So um, mistakes happen. And uh, it's a, by, by checking the websites, it, it gives you a good idea as far as uh, how to be thorough and, and make certain that, again, the worst thing we can do is walk in and ask them to co-sponsor a bill that they were the lead sponsor of. And so do your research ahead of time. Perfect. Um, this will another question going to both of you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question, but what makes follow-up effective? Dr. Carpenter? Well, I guess I, I, I'm not sure. You probably have better information about this too, David, than I do, but I think follow-up is effective if it happens and if it happens in a timely fashion. I, I think there's, they're going to pay attention to the fact that you that you thank them again in follow up, that you got back the info. You know, if, if they ask you for information and it's six or eight weeks before you respond, I don't think that's probably going to be very effective. So, I think it's doing it and getting any information that they requested. Uh, uh, to me, that's what makes it effective. Yeah, that's a really great point. The best follow up is the follow-up that is actually completed, that's conducted. Um, and believe it or not, a lot of folks fail to do that. Uh, timeliness is important. Remember that some of this is based on level of effort. Congressional offices and state offices are pulled in a lot of different directions. Sometimes it's incumbent upon us to demonstrate how important that it is. And yes, I've never been a medical student, so I have no idea what the demands of time are. I've had friends who have been medical students. It sounds like a really difficult time. It's also difficult to be a member of Congress. Um, are we finding the time? If it's really important to you, right? That's sort of the one thing they always say, we always have time for that which is important. Um, finding a way, if you're sending an email, you can send that email at two in the morning. It's not gonna wake anybody up, but conducting the follow-up in a timely manner, um, providing the information that was either requested or promised, and then, if you don't hear anything back, follow up again within a week or so. Um, you know, give them a little bit of time um, to verify that they got it. Maybe went into spam. Maybe they didn't know it. That, that's the worst thing is to not verify whether or not they received the follow up, whatever type of, of mechanism we used. If it went into spam, if the U.S. Postal Service didn't deliver a handwritten note that we that we wrote, how horrible to find out that they never got it and we never checked to verify that they got it. And now they think that we didn't close the loop when actually we were um, we jumped on things right away and, and followed up as, as quickly as possible, so. Okay, um, that's all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much, David and Dr. Carpenter for joining us for the session. And thank you all for really submitting some really great questions that I'm sure everyone will truly um, be able to use the answers to be successful tomorrow for our visits. Thank you so much, Brittany. Thank you.